Right, hello everybody, welcome back to the James Lawrence Allcott channel. We are back again with another half-time, full-time reaction. You should know the deal by now. It is currently half-time, it's currently nil-nil in a tactical battle between Chelsea and Spurs, which is exactly what we're expecting. So that's not a surprise. I'm going to react now to what I've seen so far, what I think might be the way that you maybe change it up a little bit, where the game's being won and lost, although of course they're drawing at the moment. And then we move on at, to full time and I'll give you my final reaction at the end of the game. In terms of the lineups, uh, a couple of changes really, not too much and, and we're pretty much what we were expecting. And when it comes to Chelsea, that 4-3-3, um, a good few changes, actually eight I think of the, the team that played on Tuesday night in the Champions League start in this game, which shows that for Chelsea and for Lampard, they're still trying to get that consistency in that chemistry in terms of the team but Zayac the big one in terms of players that were coming back into the side Abraham kept his place for Spurs a bit more of a change in terms of a big change that you think might kind of make a difference in this game and I think we went and saw it in that first half uh, Joe Roden no not the guy who does the podcast Joe Roden the centre-back who's come from Swansea into the Spurs squad and has now been thrust into it because Alderweireld was injured for this game and when I looked at it I thought this is a big game for that kind of player to be coming into, uh, alongside an Eric Dyer who is growing week on week. Uh, I'm very scared. I put a tweet out saying, actually, this Eric Dyer guy, he's all right. He could be a decent centre-back. Uh, we'll get into that in a second, but let's have a look at the stats first because the game I thought was interesting, if not <laughs> full of action. Uh, in terms of the dominance of the game, 61% possession there for Chelsea they've had the ball a hell of a lot but exactly what I thought was going to happen when I saw the sort of passing stats of this game in terms of accurate passes Silva, Zuma, Reese James, Chilwell, Kante it's all been played uh, in front of Spurs pretty much for the bulk of this game and the big frustration I think for Chelsea is that Spurs are very very well connected in terms of how they're keeping their shape in the defensive side of the game and if you look at touches look at the look at Tammy Abraham there the least touches of any outfield player in this game. Now, I don't think this is his fault. And I actually think it's a smart choice to play him in this game because you've got that bit more physical presence. But the problem you've got with this team at the moment, if I go back to those passes, is that Spurs are allowing them to play round the side, round the side, round the side, and not able to get behind them in any way, shape or form. And you even see that with the two, two players that they play in midfield in Hoiberg and Musa Sissoko. Uh, keeping them out of this zone 14. So Google zone 14, if you haven't uh, heard of it before, but it's an area of the, of the pitch where I think Chelsea are really struggling to get the ball in those areas. And Jose Mourinho, I think, has been careful to sort of protect the, the team and the centre-backs, maybe, maybe in Joe Roden in this game. But more importantly, not allowing this Chelsea team to get the ball in those kind of areas. On the other hand, I actually think Spurs have been a bit more... Uh, positive than they were in the Man City game, but also they are focusing on that zone 14 area, which is where someone like Kane is so influential in a game like this. Overall, Chelsea with a back four, uh, when you play that kind of uh, system for, for Spurs, it's really interesting how someone like Harry Kane, if he gets the, if he drops deep and picks up the ball in those areas, because it's Harry Kane, you don't want to let him turn and shoot uh, because it's Harry Kane. But you also don't want to let him turn to be able to play the passes that he can do. So it naturally kind of sucks in a lot of the, the players around it when he gets on that ball. It highlights his intelligence sort of earlier up, sort of higher up on the pitch. Uh, if he gets the ball in those areas, you've got the space in behind to make those transitions. And that's almost a trigger for Son or Bergwijn to, to get involved. Son playing on the right-hand side again, like he did in the Man City game. Bergwijn, who's struggled in this game so far, hasn't really been able to get it, get things moving so far. I think pretty much down that right-hand side, there's been a few moments where it could have they could have a bit, had a bit of an overload against Chelsea, but Ori has not been great with his uh, distribution. Uh, Ndombele and Zayek are the two players who've given the ball away the most in this first half, and that makes sense. One, because Zayek, I think, is just kind of just pop, popping in some crosses, which I don't mind hitting a, a, a decent area, but it's probably what Spurs are quite happy with. If they're resorting to those kind of passes, you might see Timo Werner getting on the end of it at the, at the back post because um, you've got that kind of the opposite in terms of Zayat coming in and then Werner going at the back post. But overall, I think Spurs will be quite happy about that. Spurs going forward, you can see Son picking up the ball in those spaces and Dombele picking up the ball in those spaces and importantly, Harry Kane picking up the ball in those spaces. But to be honest, defences have been on top. 
Um, there's not the same space for Spurs going forward. And uh, like I said, the, the weak point for Spurs is the area where I'm still a little bit concerned in, in terms of Eric Dyer and Joe Roden. Eric Dyer, I've, I'm, dare I say it, he's a kind of press proof. By that, I mean, he is, look, he's a centre midfielder playing at centre back. He's got so much experience with that. So when someone comes at him, he's not too concerned. There's these lovely little flicks. He looks so languid and he's got his shirt tucked out and he looks like he's a bit of a mess. But actually, game on game, he's really grown for me. So it'd be interesting to see if he makes a mistake now in the second half. Joe Roden, you can see the nerves just sort of shaking through him throughout that first half. He got away with a big mistake. There was a goal that was uh, given offside for, for Chelsea um, after 10 minutes. Uh, Werner getting the goal and it came from a road and mistake and that can that can really kind of cripple the confidence of a player if that hadn't been offside he got away with it then he's had a deflected moment as well which kind of got it went to the goalkeeper it's fine but he seems quite nervous it all leads to a draw for me because I don't think I don't think Chelsea have got the chemistry yet and I also think Mourinho's got this spot on He's kind of called his bluff a little bit. And so he's gone to press at, at different times. He's not been as defensive as he normally is. Um, but overall, you know, Chelsea's defence has stood up quite well so far. For me, the problem is, let's have a look at the subs and how you can make those changes. I think for Spurs, you keep it the same. Because if you get out of here with a draw, you're really, really happy. For Chelsea, they need to be able to move the ball through quicker. Uh, N'Golo Kante keeping the ball, but... He hasn't been able to make those incisive passes. I think part of that's down to the fact that Kovacic hasn't really got involved at all. I think he's been pretty poor. Um, he's also kind of in the areas where Hoiberg and uh, Sissoko are as well. And then further forward, you've got Werner who's out wide and Ziyech who's out wide. And so there's too much traffic there. They're not able to get the ball uh, kind of through the middle of the pitch. So it's difficult. Can they move the ball through a little bit quicker? For Spurs, keep it the same. They're kind of, they're kind of um, zoning in on Kante in terms of having two players either side of him, be it Ndombele, Son, Harry Kane. And Kante can be as wonderful as he, as he can in terms of interceptions. But if you've got two players either side of him, again, it kind of stuns the whole defence and they have to stand still a little bit. So I'm impressed by Spurs so far in terms of the strategy that they put forward. It hasn't clicked for them just yet. For Chelsea, they've got a lot more on the bench, but... Someone like Abraham, who will get taken off, I don't think it's down to him playing badly. They're just not able to get the ball to him. So do you change it with like a, a Jorginho and try and get the ball to him that way? Do you play Havertz and sit him in the middle and ask him to get on the ball a little bit more? Or do you bring on someone like Jorginho, have a bit of a double pivot with Kante and move Mount further forward? Because I think, look, we've all seen that intelligence from Mount and his ability to play different positions and play in those half spaces. So maybe, maybe you want to get Mason Mount a little bit further forward and bring Jorginho on. I think they'll keep it the same for another 20 minutes and then they'll make those changes. I also think it will stay exactly the same. I thought, I said nil-nil before the game. I see it ending nil-nil. Let's see what happens at full time. I forgot to say... I keep looking at the subs bench and I feel like Gareth Bale's got a part to play in this. Bergwijn's not played so so well so far. He might put more on instead, but I've just got this funny feeling Gareth Bale's going to score an absolute banger. So I'm just going to say that now. The time is is uh, 30 minutes past five. Okay, so if that happens, I want the credit for it. Just what I'd say. See you at the end. <laughs> I did say. I did say it was going to be nil-nil. Uh, I'll give you my reaction. Uh, the big thing I want to talk about is that the Premier League is up for grabs, ladies and gentlemen. But before I get into that, um, one thing if I can ask for you, if you've watched this far and you've enjoyed it so far, I'm trying to get myself to 60k. It'd be amazing to do it before the end of this year. I've got a long way to go. I'm on 57 at the moment. But if you haven't subscribed yet, but you've watched my content uh, over the months, years, whatever, um, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. I'd really, really appreciate it. And of course, hit the like button as well. Anyway, let's get into it because... Yeah, there's not a huge amount to say about that second half. I think at, look, at half time, I was I was giving Spurs a lot of the praise. Second half, I think Chelsea came out and Lampard did improve the team and improve the setup. What we were saying was that the the back four were sort of getting the ball and passing a, a, along each other, but not moving the ball forward quickly enough. I think he made his peace, Lampard, with the fact that he wasn't going to be able to play through, which was something that I was suggesting at half time, but maybe wasn't wasn't right. He felt like a better way of doing it is almost kind of play it in to play it out, get Reese James and Chilwell further up the pitch, and then play those early crosses in. I said about Tammy Abraham as well. He had a few moments, didn't he? I think he's not totally got that confidence yet. I think this is, what, this is what I mean about literally everyone on that pitch doesn't know if 
their title contenders. Obviously, you've got World Cup winners in that team and, and bits and pieces when it comes to Chelsea. But Tammy Abraham played in that game and just didn't have that complete swagger and confidence to get in, get on the end of it. They brought on Giroud, who had... Like, I've got very few notes for this game because Giroud had a chance in the last minute, tried to lob Lloris, then they went down the other end. Lacelso basically just... He got a bit of a nosebleed up there, despite actually scoring last week. I don't know what happened there. He lost his way a little bit. Um, but those were the two real chances of note, really. I think Chelsea tried to offer a little bit more. And I think the substitutions gave a real message of what they were trying to do. And Dombele had played 60 minutes earlier in the week. So I think they were always going to take him off. But if you look at the dribbles that any of the players played on the pitch, let's show you that. He offers so much uh, in that part of it. You know, the dribble attempts at the very least. There you go. Look, came off pretty early on and had more dribble attempts than any other player. So when you take him off and bring on Lo Celso, it's a completely different player. And Lo Celso, basically, when I was watching him, he spent the rest of the half just sort of kicking people, which I know he's a great player, but he's, he's different. He's different to Ndombele. And so they lost that sort of attacking thrust, the ability to take a player out of the game, uh, the ability to kind of get Kante a bit more uh, nervous about his defensive work. And, and so it kind of went into Chelsea's hands. And for Spurs, with the substitution that they made or the lack thereof, you know, the fact that you're bringing on a left back for a left back, Reguilon had just got himself booked, so I understand that. But to not take Steven Bergwijn off um, was odd to me. Uh, it was negative to me. But again, I come back to that idea that the, the Premier League is up for grabs here because both these managers are managing this game in particular. You know, this is, where are we? November at a macro level. It's about not losing this game. It's about not losing momentum. You've got Liverpool who've lost their their game. Uh, sorry, drawn their game yesterday, dropping points. And you look at the look at the table now. God, it is so up for grabs. You've got Leicester City playing Fulham, a team second bottom, and you know they could go they go top. You know, joint top as well. So that and Man City after that victory, they've got Man City have got an incredible run of games between now. And I think February 6th or something like that. They play Man United in a couple of weeks and they play Chelsea down the road. But apart from that, it's all teams that aren't really seen as title contenders at this stage. And so the Premier League really is up for grabs. I said it before. We know Mourinho by this point. Get out of there with a draw. You get to get three points if you can at home. Go and win those other games. I think that's where we're going to see this strength of depth. Because I think in the forward line, Spurs have it. But I think elsewhere, maybe they don't. One thing I would say with the substitutes, with Ndombele coming, being taken off, I would love seeing Deli Alli play in this game. I think you had a strategy that was working really well for Spurs there, but Deli Alli's not even on the bench, so you can't bring him on. Chelsea made quite a few changes, um, all you know, kind of attacking because they've got that depth. So you've got Chelsea who need to kind of up the tempo, up the chemistry, which takes time. I think one leads to the other, chemistry, then tempo. For Spurs, it's, it is game on game and it is about Mourinho's strategy because he's got the buying of the players to a level that we've not really seen for, for a while. And in a, a season that's going to be a bit of a war of attrition, they've got some really nice advantages, which include the Europa League, you know, being allowed to be played with a, a separate squad at this moment in time. And, you know, I think they've qualified already. So they, you have to, you actually have to give them the, the credit that they are, they're manoeuvring their way to put them in put them into a position where they could win a title because Liverpool who I think are f you know far ahead when it comes to the first team have so many challenges in front of them right now and more and more players getting injured and that element of luck or the element of, of, of squad management I think Chelsea and Spurs with a big big slice of luck of course they they've got they've got better depth and better squads right now if you look at the eleven that gets put out for for Liverpool at the moment, they are struggling, and and three or four defeats can can really make you lose your momentum. Then you haven't got any confidence, and then it all gets a little bit scary. So not too much to say about the game itself. I think, look, man of the match. I was going to go with Joe Roden out of kindness because I don't think he'd played that good of a game, but I, I really didn't think there was anyone else I could pick. And I'll be honest, I'm, I'm who am I picking? I might lean. Somewhere near towards Reguilon, maybe. Or Kante, maybe. You help me with this one. Let me know in the comments below who was the man of the match in this nil-nil uh, game. And and when it comes to this sort of the long run of the title race, it really, really is interesting. I did a, a video looking at all of them right now. And I don't think my opinions changed too much on any of them. 
Who do you see as the front runners at the moment? And and our Chelsea and Spurs, who do you see as the front runners? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, as I said, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. It will be an amazing Christmas present to get to 60K. So if you're not subscribed, hit the button and I'll see you next time.